uh, previous oh, weeks oh. in that uh, I'm going to be reading a whole lot more from uh, my Bible as it relates to various uh, events uh, in the New Testament. Um, what I'm trying to take a look at today is at Herod the Great. Uh, and I, also, I guess I need to say, my uh, what I'm thinking about talking about today, while it is true, while it's, I think it's applicable for everyone, I have particular uh, interest uh, in this subject for those of you who are going on the trip. Uh, because uh, as soon as we drive 20 miles from where you will spend the first night, uh, you'll be looking at Herod the Great. And uh, it's important that we know about this guy. People don't uh, think of um, uh, Roman kings and emperors. People don't tend to want to go to, let's say, Israel because of them. Uh, that's, that's not the motivation, so I know that. But uh, on the other hand, uh, this guy, Herod the Great, is a significant player in the narratives of the Gospels. Uh, he has an entire dynasty that is woven into the fabric of all of the four Gospels and the Book of Acts. Uh, and it's important that we kind of uh, ferret things out. It's also significant, depending on what version of the Bible that you're reading. Uh, you'll, well, first of all, you see that the handout that I gave you today uh, contains a lot of people, a lot, the names of a lot of people most of which begin with the word Herod. The problem with some modern translations is that the translators will simply translate what is there in the Greek text. And the only thing that is there in the Greek text is the word Herod. So when you read Herod, in Matthew 2, and then you read Herod in Luke 23, and then you read Herod in Acts chapter 12, and you read Herod in Acts chapter 23, you might think you're reading about the same guy. You're reading about four different guys. And how can I read about Herod in Acts when I'm told that he died in Luke? Well, you can't. It's a different guy. But, uh, and some modern translations have fleshed it out, helpfully, I think. Uh, in fact, for the most part, I'm going to be, I'll, the translation, I mean, the, the, the translation of, what I'm, of the verses that I'm reading through this, you'll be able to see immediately that it's Herod the Great, or it's Herod Antipas, or it's Herod Agrippa, or whoever it is, in other words, that information is added. It's not there in the Bible, but it's added um, very helpful, as, as, in my opinion, as it should be added, so that we don't, so that we understand more fully and we're not confused in the process. Now, remember last week, those of you who were here, remember that I said that the New Testament tends to portray uh, Roman influence. Uh, upon uh, Palestinian life fairly pessimistically, fairly negatively, and the one exception to that was where we were last week. In other words, how many, on how many occasions in the New Testament, in point of fact, do we have Roman soldiers who embrace the faith? Yeah? We talked about that last week in conjunction with, with the lesson. Well, perhaps now to go back so to speak, more to the negative side of the ledger, today might be um, Exhibit A uh, in the way in which the New Testament is portraying Roman influence uh, somewhat negatively. None of these guys is going to be portrayed positively uh, in our biblical text. So uh, anyhow, uh, as I say, it's a l it can be a little bit confusing because actually I believe... I believe uh, the word Herod appears about 65 or 70 times in our New Testaments. And so it's not an isolated question. It's not an isolated consideration. Uh, one guy can't do it. Well, first of all, one person couldn't have lived as long as all of these uh, references uh, uh, identify that. Uh, but more importantly, um, they're 
uh, we're able to identify different characters. So I'm going to I'm going to work off of the handout that I gave you. The purpose of my handout is to try to give to you <coughs> Herod and the various people who are related to Herod and all of the biblical citations. So if you go clear over to the right column, when I say, for example, there are ten citations for Herod the Great, as far as I know, those are all of the citations of Herod in the entire New Testament. And when we say there's only one citation of a guy whose name is Herod Archelaus, who's the son, uh, that's the one and only. But on the other hand, the other one of the sons of Herod the Great, his name is Herod Antipas, and we have 25 citations. In other words, I'm giving to you, as far as I know, uh, in the correct block, all of the citations of all of the Herods, so that you can figure that out. But I want to start with Herod the Great, because he's, he's not only the first one who is identified in Scripture, he's also, as it were, the father of the dynasty. And as you can see, uh, although there are these ten citations, Almost all of them have to do with one narrative and with one event in Matthew 2, and that's the birth narrative of Jesus. He was king at the time that Jesus was born. But because of certain things in the narrative, I'd like to read this, at least the first part of this uh, narrative, uh, so that we get a, a feel for Herod. Um, I'll start with uh, verse 1. Jesus was born, I'm, I'm reading from Matthew 2, 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, saying, asking, Where is the king of the Jews? We saw his stars that rose in the east, and we have come to worship him. Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as, he was, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and the teachers of religious law and said, and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, for this is what the prophet wrote, O you, O Bethlehem, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler shall come out of you who will be the shepherd to my people Israel. And so then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. He said to them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child where the mother Mary and the uh, 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 and, and with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, because God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men had gone. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, get at, flee to Egypt with, with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until I, uh, I, until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod became furious. He went into a furious rage. He became furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years of old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. All right, let's talk about Herod uh, the Great a little bit. Uh, Herod was not born a Jew, but he did marry a Jewess. Uh, he came from a land called, called, in the Old Testament, it's called the land of Edom. In the, land, in the era of the New Testament, it's called the land of Edomia. 
and it's immediately to the south of Judea. So if you think of uh, going from north to south, you have Galilee, and then Samaria, and then Judea, and then Idumea. Edomites in the Old Testament. And um, after the death of Alexander the Great, and uh, his empire started falling apart, uh, it splintered into several different major groups, and two of them were important for the land of Palestine. One was called the Ptolemies, and one was called the Seleucids. And they're fighting back and forth, and this ends ultimately, their, their fighting ended ultimately uh, in uh, a, a closing of the temple, uh, in uh, some horrible desecration uh, of Jewish life, and as a result, Jews rebelled against that, and there, there, it, there was an inauguration of an era called the Maccabean uh, era, or the Maccabean Revolt. And there were certain Maccabean uh, rulers who, uh, including Judas Maccabeus and brothers and nephews and so forth, and what they tried to do was not only reopen the temple, but they tried to go beyond their own territory and forcibly make other people Jewish, by which I mean to be circumcised. And one of the places where many of those Maccabean rulers went was immediately to the south of Judea, into the land of Idumea. And so the grandfather of Herod the Great um, became Jewish in that way. Uh, and uh, was, uh, was loyal to the Maccabeans, and so they made him, so to speak, a crown prince. Herod's grandfather became a crown prince. Well, of course, time, time, time flies, you know, and he dies, and his son, and, and sooner or later, the, his, uh, Herod's father, that is, the son of the man who was originally made the prince, uh, was a very close ally of Julius Caesar. And, as a matter of fact, uh, Julius Caesar was involved himself in a war in Egypt. Uh, and uh, as, as a result of uh, Herod's father, father's assistance, in that war in Egypt, Julius Caesar named the father of Herod ruler of Judea and crown prince of all of that land. Immediately, this guy's name was Antipater, but it doesn't really matter. Immediately, Antipater took his two sons, and he gave his older son, he made him the military governor over Jerusalem. That was Herod's older brother. And he took his younger son, who was only 25 years of, of age at the time, and he made him military ruler over Galilee. So that's how Herod even gets into power, because of his father's appointment. Well, so far so very good for Herod, but uh, only about three years later, Julius Caesar is assassinated. And within about two years of that, the Parthian enemies of Rome, people who controlled the area that we know of today as, let's say, Persia and Afghanistan and uh, Iran, um, they invaded uh, Palestine. And in fact, they invaded the whole of Palestine, and Herod had to hightail it. In fact, uh, Herod's brother uh, must have been a little not so fleet of foot. He didn't hightail it quite as fast. The Parthians got him, and that's and and he. The historians say he committed suicide. <laughs> that's what you call assisted. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, he committed suicide. Yeah. Uh, you put that in quotation marks. Herod, on the other hand, took off, uh, fled to Petra, and when the dust settled, he weaseled his way on a boat, went to Rome, and in Rome, he had a very close and very powerful military ally whose name was Mark Antony. Some of you guys are familiar like with Antony and Cleopatra, one and the same. Uh, Mark Antony was an extremely important Roman senator, and Antony succeeded in persuading the entire Roman Senate <clears throat> to affirm uh, Herod king of the Jews. Uh, it was in their interest, uh, you, you understand the Parthians were the enemies of Rome, and now the Parthians are in Palestine and in control. They need someone to kick the bad guys out. 
and the Roman Senate unanimously uh, nominated Herod as king of the Jews. So you have that expression, king of the Jews, both in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, and that is found no, no fewer than six, six or seven times in classical uh, literature. So uh, the idea is he was king of the Jews. And at that point, they gave him a few legions and gave him a few boats, and Herod takes off back to uh, Palestine. It takes him about two years, and it's pretty bloody. But at the end of those two years, uh, he succeeds in liberating the city of Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem is liberated, Herod becomes actual king. And he's king then for 34 years, from about 37 B.C. down to about 4 B.C. Now, I realize some, some of you might say, wait, wait a second, wasn't he king when Jesus was born? Yes. But you say that he died in 4 B.C.? Yes, actually he died in late March or early April of 4 B.C. Well, how could Jesus be born B.C.? Was Jesus before B.C.? Yes. Yes, he was. Uh, B.C. A.D. calendration is something that came into existence about 1100 A.D., Long, well, long after the events of the Bible, but long before uh, the advent of what we would call leap year uh, and what is associated with that in the calendar. So everyone today would say that uh, chronologi chronologically speaking, it is, it is most probable that Jesus was born somewhere between 7 and 4 B.C. And Herod died in 4 B.C. So there wasn't a whole lot of, of overlap. And in fact, we've read about his death. Herod um, is, is a, an interesting person to think about, both positively and negatively. As a public king, as the king of the Jews, uh, it was a largely positive experience that Jews would have had. It's true, they still lived in a bit of poverty. Uh, he was taxing them very heavily, but their land was free of war, and it had been experiencing war for four or five decades before that time. So in that sense, it was constructive. That is to say, it was free of the destructive effects of warfare. On the other hand, he just started building all over the place. And uh, he builds a capital city uh, called Caesarea, out on, the, out on the Mediterranean Sea, he just goes to a place where there's nothing and puts up a, it became the capital city. Jerusalem is not the capital city of, of Israel in the days of the New Testament. Those prefects, those procurators, those kings came to Jerusalem in holy days to help keep law and order. But they lived in Caesarea. He built this thing out almost out of nothing. And it's grandiose. I mean, he, as an example, um, he builds a harbor, the second largest harbor in the entire Roman world. The harbor at Caesarea is, about three, is, is bigger than about 350 acres. It is huge. Some of the stones that are laid into the underwater in the uh, harbor, the, the, the breakwater, uh, many of those stones are still there. Uh, weigh in excess of 2,000 tons. They are so finely cut that mortar wasn't even be wasn't even uh, it wasn't even necessary. And that's just that Caesarea. And then, of course, there's not one drop of fresh water at Caesarea. And there's 100,000 people living in Caesarea in the days of Jesus. He builds an aqueduct that is calculated to have brought something in excess of 60 million gallons of water to Caesarea every day. Now, by way of comparison, <clears throat> the first major aqueduct that was built for New York City was built, I believe it was in the year 1842, but it was sometime around 1840. And at that point, there were 500,000 people living in New York City. And the aqueduct conveyed about 60 to 65 million gallons a day. Herod did this, almost the same capacity, and he only had 100,000 people living in Caesarea, and he does it in the time 
just before the time uh, of Jesus. I mean, he built on a monumental scale. And of course, this is just one town. Uh, he builds Jerusalem. In other words, uh, we talk about the temple that is going to be destroyed in 60 AD, excuse me, 70 AD. That was the temple that was built by Herod. That's the temple which, according to the Gospel of John, was in process, that they, they had been building it for 46 years. That's Herod's temple that was being built. Remember, Jesus says, uh, you build this temple, you destroy this temple, I'll restore it in three days. He was referring to the fact he was going to, how can you do that? We've been building this thing for 46 years, is what they tell Jesus. And that's Herod's temple. And the Herod's temple, I've, I've just, uh, I'll pass this around if you want to see it. It's, I, it's not... It doesn't, it's not so reflective except by way of colors. You can see, I think you can see some yellow on that. You can see a, see a little bit of yellow here. You can see a little bit of green. You can see a little bit of purple. And you see a lot of red. Whatever's in red, and this is stuff that you guys who are going with me are going to see. Whatever's in red was built by Herod the Great. It is one of the largest man-made structures ever built. I have it here in black. To give, you a, to give you a sense, of, it took 10,000 men 10 years just to build the platform. What is in red here is the actual dimensions and size of the Colosseum in Rome. I don't know if you've been there. This, this circle right here, see that little dot? That's the diameter of the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. This is the New Orleans Superdome. Oh, by the way, that, that's the Parthenon. This is the New Orleans Superdome. This is the Georgia Dome, 840 feet in diameter. I think you can put three and a half of them inside the platform that Herod built. That green, that's the size of an American football field. You can put 17 of them just on the platform. In other words, this is, this is it really, uh, well, it's the largest man-made platform in area that we know of until the modern era. I mean, he built lavishly. He built on a grand scale. And mind you, I've only talked about Jerusalem, and I've only talked about Caesarea. He built fortress palaces. Uh, he, had, he had more than a dozen of them. Uh, um, uh, you're going to see, you, you who are going with me, you're going to see the Herodian. You're going to see Jericho. You're going to see Masada. Uh, you're going to see the Alexandria. Uh, you will see others from a distance. Herod built them all. Huge structures with large stones. Remember I told you a couple of weeks ago he took one mountain, took one hill, and put it on top of another, and then he built his... Yeah, that, that's, that was uh, the Herodium. That's just one of about 12. And mind you, he didn't... These things were not open to the public. He built these things largely for himself. In three of them, he had a swimming pool that was approximately one and one half, so one and one half times or greater that of the size of an Olympic swimming pool. In one of them, and you will see this one, it is so large that there were boats that got into it and they had like play war games just for his pleasure. Uh, in, um, uh, in, not Masada, excuse me, uh, well, Masada, that's grandeur too, a three-story uh, palace uh, that goes on, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, at the Herodium, he built, a, he built a theater just for himself, and it, it contains, um, I mean, there's, there's richness, there's ornament, he had uh, windows with shutters and paint and art which we think prob it's so grand, it's so magnificent, it's so expensive, that it, uh, the only, uh, uh, the only uh, similarities that we know anything about would be in rich villas in Pompeii. When the archaeologists discovered the site of Masada in the 20th century, <clears throat> among other things that were found there, were two dozen amphora, or like two or three gallon pitchers, with uh, very fancy wines called garum, and the and the label on them says garum for the king. So we know who this was, who was supposed to consume this. Well, 
in the first century, uh, Pliny the Elder says that one amphora would cost around between 2,500, I'll put it in dollars, he doesn't use dollars, but I'll go <laughs> allow me to become anachronistic. Between 2,500 and $3,000 per amphora. Let me put that in context. One quart of wine in the first century would have cost between one and four dollars. The average salary of a Roman legionnaire in the first century is between 900 and 1200 dollars. He had, Herod had, we found, approximately two and a half dozen uh, amphora filled with garum. Garum is, a, it's like, uh, the closest analogy today would be beluga caviar. It, it, it's a very uh, rare and expensive kind of fish uh, that you take, I guess, and you put salt in it and it make kind of like a sauce condiment and you, you know, you, you, you can't double dip, of course, but you can. <laughs> uh, you know, there were, and, he, and he imported his from Spain because it was the best. He imported wines from at least two Greek islands. And the thing is, when uh, uh, Josephus, uh, Pastor Todd made reference to Josephus Day. That's a name you need to become familiar with. Uh, Josephus is a Roman, uh, excuse me, a Jewish uh, historian. Um, he, uh, he became the historian for the Roman emperor. Uh, the same guy who takes out Jerusalem in 70 AD. You've heard the name Titus, the Roman emperor and his father Vespasian, these guys in effect hire Josephus to write the story of that war and then he follows that up with the story of the history of the Jews. So he writes a lot, he, he knows a lot about a lot of people and a lot of things and so forth. Anyhow, uh, Josephus talks in his, in the, in his uh, um, section on the war he talks about the Romans capturing Masada. You may remember that uh, the so-called uh, war ended not when Jerusalem fell, but it ended when Masada fell, and you, you're probably familiar with the story of Masada. Anyhow, the Romans captured Masada. This is what Josephus says. <clears throat> I want to quote this because it's... <clears throat> He says, when the Romans captured Masada in the, and I'm adding, in the year 8 AD 73, which means they captured Masada more than 70 years after Herod died. When they captured it, he says, they, the Romans, discovered a lavish stockpile of stored grain, wine, oil, pulse, and dates. The historian Josephus adds that this mass of durable goods was still undecayed and was amply sufficient to last for years and that it had been stashed there by Herod. And I said, even if one were to assume a bit of exaggeration on Josephus' part, this offers an amazing insight into a guy who was quite willing to care for his every dietary whim and need. And the most important part of that is that we have no record that Herod ever actually visited Masada even one time after he became king. During the years in which Herod was the king, he tended, well, he hung out a lot in Jerusalem and he hung out a lot in Caesarea, but when he wasn't in those two places, he hung out in a palace that he built for himself down in Jericho or maybe at the Herodium. He hung out at those places, not at Masada. And when he got older, he became increasingly inflicted with uh, medical issues, probably, but not definitely the result of overweight and also probably eating a lot of garum along the way. Uh, and so he spends his life on the other side of the Dead Sea at a uh, mineral springs trying to, you know, soak the bad stuff. Uh, out of him, and he builds a fortress right beside it. In fact, it's the fortress where John the Baptist is going to lose his life. So, in other words, when Herod was king, and he went on a trip, 
he tended to spend his time in Jericho at the Rhodium and at Machaerus on the other side, not at Masada. So one can only imagine the dietary delights that Herod is likely to have stashed at the places where he actually went during the years in which he was king. Okay, now, so he lived life pretty well. I mean, Herod uh, was a, a benefactor of the Olympics. Herod became the president of the Olympics. Do you know that the Olympics were once held in Caesarea? The only time in antiquity when the Greek Olympics were ever held on the continent of Asia. And you guys who are going with me are going to be able to sit right at the starting line. Exactly where Herod would have sat there and enjoyed the whole thing. Just like Mr. Putin was just enjoying the whole thing. A life of opulence and overindulgence in every kind of way. One of his indulgences relates to the kind of the negative side of his life. And this is bringing us closer and closer to Jesus. And that is that Herod uh, engaged in uh, polygamy. Jewish tradition at that point permitted polygamy and Herod, true to his character, was uh, anxious to take advantage of every opportunity like that that he could. And uh, we know from historians that, Je that Herod married 10 times. He had 10 different wives. All political, all unhappy. Caesar Augustus, you know, in the days of Caesar Augustus, there went out a decree, or right, Caesar Augustus is a contemporary of Herod. Caesar Augustus so trusted Herod, and, and Herod, if he was anything, was politically trustworthy. He so trusted Herod that he said to Herod, I'm going to let you write your own will. You decide who's going to succeed you on this Judean throne. Now, what at first blush may seem to be an unusual, extraordinary opportunity granted to him by no less than the uh, Roman emperor becomes the bane of Herod's tortured existence at home. Because each one of those ten wives and his mother's in law and his sister and his own mother jealously covet to make sure it's their son or their sons who get the nod. <clears throat> and the infighting that goes on inside that court is worthy of more than one Hollywood movie. <laughs> Deception, lies, treachery, suicides, suicides, uh, uh, police actions in the middle of the night, uh, drownings. I mean, it goes on and on and on. In, Herod, in the last 10 years of Herod's life, he wrote five different wills. In that same decade, he divorced two of his wives, he murdered one of his wives, he murdered three of his sons and 300 of their supporters, a countless number of pretenders, uh, political enemies, and so forth, because everyone wanted his throne. Uh, and as, as, and it, 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 it was so bad in his, it, I mean, it's not as, I mean, it was bad inside of his court and inside of his family. But during those, during that very same decade, I'm talking now between 13 and 4, he dies in 4 BC. <clears throat> between 13 and 4, when he, when he wrote those five of his 10, he actually had 10 wills, he had 10 wives and 10 wills. But he wrote five of them in the last 10 years. Um... But he became, he, he was, he, uh, he simply was unable to find cure and even relief from his medical maladies. I mean, there are people who, there are historians who will tell you, maybe they're, maybe they're exaggerating a little bit, but there are people who will tell you that Herod, he was 300 pounds by the time he died. 
I don't know that he was that overweight, but I know that he was a very unfortunate man at that point. And uh, Josephus again tells us that towards the end of that decade, towards the end of that decade, after he, well, there, there were these failed attempts to take his throne, to take his life, where he's obliged, I guess you would say, he felt obliged to take, to, to, to divorce two of his wives, murder one, and all this other stuff. At the end of that, at the end of that period, uh, Josephus says he actually attempted suicide himself because he became so uh, angry at the fact that he could find no cure. Towards the end of this period, I'm reading now, towards the end of this period, I mean those last 10 years, towards the end of this period, Herod despaired of recovering from his physical stuff. And he grew fierce, Josephus says, he grew fierce and indulged in the bitterest anger upon all occasions. At one point he seriously contemplated, and I had perhaps attempted suicide. He says, this is Josephus, his life had become unbearable and he trusted not one single person at the age of 70. Now, it's very important that we realize it's exactly at this moment, at the end of that decade, when he learns of yet another potential palace coup. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? It's exactly when he heard it. So in that kind of a context, you immediately understand that he became greatly distressed. He resorted at once to deception. Oh, you guys go find him and come back and let me know so that I could go and worship him. <laughs> Meaning, let me show you my kind of worship. Yeah. Uh, and when he realized he had been outwitted, uh, uh, Matthew says he was outraged. And he institutes that program to kill all male boys two years of age and older. So that's Herod. He's a big guy. He's an important guy. <laughs> Uh, but like everyone else, he comes and goes. And when he goes, uh, his last two wills were contested before Caesar Augustus, by the way. <laughs> and uh, having written all those wills, wills um, it was Caesar Augustus himself who decided who was going to get this. And basically what he did, uh, I have in my atlas here, and don't worry about those blue lines, that's marking something else, but you see all of the color, all of that is pink and blue and green and yellow, that's a territory that was the realm of Herod the Great. And what Caesar did was he divided it into three pieces, and he gave a part to each of his three, uh, to, to three of his uh, boys. So he gave, uh, this is the guy who is number two on the list, Herod Archelaus. In other words, he gave Archelaus what we would call Samaria and Judea. I'll come back to that in a bit. He gave uh, uh, an, uh, another one of his sons uh, the area that we know of uh, uh, as your number three. Number three is the green guy. Number two is the orange guy. And number four is the pinkish guy, that's Herod, and so, now all these guys are mentioned in the New Testament, not all with the same degree of importance, but they, uh, they're all mentioned. Um, the, I'm going to give just very passing uh, reference to Har Herod Archelaus, he's only mentioned one time, and, and actually it's in the text that I read to you, because remember Joseph was told, get out of here, get to Egypt, because Herod the Great is going to try to take you. Jesus out. And so he goes to Egypt. And then the Lord says, uh, then an angel, uh, the Lord through an angel says to Joseph when he's in Egypt, you, you may return for he who sought the child's life is dead. And when they come back into, they're coming, we have to imagine they were coming back into Bethlehem where they left, uh, but they found out that Herod Archelaus was the king. And so they took off back to Nazareth. Because he, he was, he's not a good guy either. And you'll notice that he was only king for about 10 years. And the reason I'm even bringing this up is, you'll, if you take a look at the dates, when Archelaus was king, they all, all three of them obviously were made, uh, they were giving their appointment in 4 BC. 
because that's when Herod died. So you see that Archelaus, however, only lasted for about 10 years until 86, whereas Herod Antipas lasted until AD 39, and um, Philip the Tetrarch, number four, lasted until he died in either at 33 or 34. Now, what is important about this is as follows. It means that one of the three sons of Herod, the one who, who is number two, the one who happened to be ruler over Samaria and Judea, was exiled, and in place of him, Romans decided they were not going to deal with Herod or with any of the Herod sons. And so this is where, in Judea, uh, Rome introduced what is called a Roman prefect. In other words, a Roman citizen, a Roman military general. The fifth one of those guys we know of as Pontius Pilate. Now sometimes people say, wait a second, isn't there a Herod in Jerusalem when, Jer when Jesus is crucified? And didn't Pastor Todd just say this morning that uh, Pilate sent <coughs> Jesus to Herod? Yes, he did. He sent him to Herod Antipas, number three, who is, the, who is reigning in Galilee. In fact, if you read in the story, you'll see why Pilate sent Jesus to Herod Antipas. Because he discovers two things. That is, Pilate discovers two things. He discovers that Jesus is a Galilean. And he is told that the governor of Galilee is in town for the holidays. And so, uh, and Pilate is also pretty well convinced that Jesus is not guilty. So he thinks he, and his wife, remember, said, wash your hands. And so it's Pilate sends, that is, the Roman military general, who is in charge of Judea, sends Jesus across town to a guy who's in a hotel, so to speak. He's a guy who rules in Galilee. Because Jesus was a Galilean and so forth, he, he, he's trying to wash his, he's trying to say, you take care of it, it's your problem. Pilate was saying, in effect, I don't want, and you have that interchange between Herod and, well, shouldn't call it an interchange because it's a one-way speech. Herod says, are you the king of the Jews? And uh, Jesus answered, not a word. And when he could get no place with Jesus, and when he himself was also convinced that he was innocent, he says, tell you what, I'm going to send you back to Pilate, which is what happens. But it's quite interesting that both of those guys, and by the way, Herod Antipas, that, now that's the only guy on our sheets, number three. That's the only one who actually ever meets Jesus. And he meets him as part of the crucifixion narratives. But this guy is also important. Boy, I'm going to have to rush on here. Herod Antipas is also important because of John the Baptist. There are two guys. Uh, let, me, let me point you to, actually, to three people on my list. Number three, Herod Antipas. Number five, Herod Philip. And number six, Herodias. She's a woman. Even his grandkids bore the name Herod. Herodias. Number five married number six when number six was relatively young. By the way, number five was passed over. He didn't get any part of Herod's realm. So what does he do? And actually he was the he was the son of of the favored, uh, I mean, he was the son, he was a grandson, but he was a son of the favored son. He was the son of a guy named Aristobulus, who's not even mentioned in the New Testament. But until he betrayed his face, he's one of the three uh, sons of Herod who got, uh, just before Herod went down, uh, had been a favored son. And, and because of that, because of his, uh, his guilt by association, Herod passed over uh, Herod Philip, he got no, and uh, Augustus gave him no reign. So what he did was he simply picked up his marbles and his wife, went down to the Mediterranean Sea, built a pala, well, a nice house for himself, and kicked back and you know enjoyed life. He was no more a politician. 
Okay? So far, so good. 30 years later, so you do the math on how old Herodias was by this point. His stepbrother, Herod Antipas, who is the green guy on the map, he's got, you know, the green areas? Herod Antipas is making a trip to Rome. Hey, obviously, we often make trip to, trips to Rome and get their marching orders and get this, get that, and so forth. And so on the way to Rome, of course, he is going towards the Mediterranean. His stepbrother is living there. So he stops by to have, you know, toast and coffee with his stepbrother. And, oh, she may be 40 or 45, but she's looking pretty good. And becomes allured of Herodias. And when he gets back from Rome, makes a second stop with his stepbrother, but in this time makes a deal with his stepbrother's wife. And she leaves number five to become the wife of number three. From the standpoint of Herodias, it was a step up. At least number three had, a rule, had an area over which he was king. So I suppose maybe it gave her, I don't know. And that's what John, remember how John Baptist, and we can read about this, and in fact I will read about this in Mark chapter 6, because you'll notice that a lot of the references having to do with Herod Antipas have to do with John the Baptist, because John the Baptist confronts Herod Antipas. I'll start at verse uh, 16. And here is where my Bible says, Herod Antipas, the king, soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying, this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. This is why he can do such things. Others were saying he's a prophet Elijah. Still others were saying he's a prophet like the great prophets of the past. When Herod, when Herod Antipas, heard about Jesus, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has surely come back from the dead. For Herod had sent soldiers to arrest, now we have the story of how John meets his death. Uh, Mark says, for Herod had sent soldiers to arrest and imprison John as a favor to Herodias. She had been his brother Philip's wife, but Herod married her. John kept telling Herod, it is against God's law for you to marry your brother's wife. In other words, uh, the Old Testament only provided for marrying a bro uh, for one brother marrying another brother's wife after the brother died, or in what is, what is called a leveret marriage. And twice in the Old Testament, it's explicitly forbidden to marry <coughs> your brother's wife. So John is simply, so to speak, repeating Moses to Herod Antipas. Well, Herod Antipas wants to take care of him, but he's afraid that he might be speaking the truth and he's afraid of the people. He's enough of a, he's got enough political savvy, so he decides instead of taking him out, I'll put him away. So he puts him in prison. Herodias, on the other hand, doesn't have such political inhibition. And we're told here that what she does, uh, she arrange, on his birthday, she makes a big party for him. And at that party, she makes sure that there are all kinds of bigwigs who are there with him. And they're entertained by Herodias' daughter, presumably Herod Antipas' daughter. And she stands up and dances and does her thing, and she delights everyone. So much so that her father says, Give me your wish, up to the half of my kingdom, and uh, I will give you your wish. And she goes and consults with her mother, and her mother is able to realize her original intention in throwing the party in the first place. Give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And John meets his death. <clears throat> this is the guy who takes him out. And he takes him out in one of Herod's mountain fortresses. That's where John had been imprisoned, and that's where John the Baptist died. So you hear all about uh, Herod Antipas, and you can read about Herod Antipas also 
uh, in chapter 23 of Luke. That's the crucifixion narrative where Pilate sends Jesus to Herod Antipas and Herod speaks and Jesus listens and Jesus doesn't respond. And so getting nowhere with Jesus, he just sends him back to Pilate and we know that Pilate uh, took care of him. By the way, um, this goes along with what Pastor Todd was saying today. Pilate, we know, we know a good bit about Pilate from outside the Bible. I mean, this guy was a veteran military uh, uh, sort of guy. He, he knew blood and shed a lot throughout his life. He's a crushing, hard uh, soldier. We've got stories from outside of the Bible of where with little hesitation, he just took people out left and right. He's, you know, he's got all the acumen and all the skill and all the uh, uh, experience of a veteran soldier. So when, when Matthew says that even Pilate gets fearful at the shouting crowds, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. It's so bad that Matthew says even Pilate got scared. That will tell you even more, perhaps, of how treacherous and how uh, horrible that scene of Jesus' crucifixion may have been. Well, I, I need to pass on. Uh, so now, the number four is Herod Philip, uh, Herod the Tetrarch, excuse me. Uh, this is the pink guy. And, uh, I mean, the pink area. And uh, he is the guy who uh, builds Caesarea Philippi. See, it's named, he decided to name it for the Caesar and for himself, Caesarea Philippi, where Peter makes his great confession. In other words, they were way up at the foot of Mount uh, Hermon, and that's where Jesus says to the disciples, you know, whom do men say that I am? Whom do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of God. You know that in Matthew chapter 16. That takes, that takes place. Uh, in the realm of Herod uh, the Tetrarch. Now I'm going to pass over five because in effect uh, I've already talked about him. He's the, he's the first husband of Herodias. I'll pass over number six since that's a uh, granddaughter. She doesn't have a realm. But now we come to number seven. Now we're talking about the grandson. Now we've come to the third generation of Herods. So there was Herod the Great. He multiplied into three. After those three are taken out, you'll see that about that time, the grandson of Herod, who's also called Herod in our Bibles, but it's Herod Agrippa, this is the guy that we encounter in Acts chapter 12. Uh, and there are uh, several contexts. You should read uh, that. Uh, uh, he is, uh, in Acts chapter 12, he is, I would say, stridently persecuting the early church. That's what Acts 12 is saying. Uh, the disciple of Jesus, James, James the son of Zebedee, not James the brother of Jesus, but James the... He had him executed. That is, Herod had him executed. That's what Acts 12 tells us. Uh, he had Peter imprisoned in Jerusalem. And when Peter was freed from prison... And um, Herod couldn't find out where, where Peter was. You'll, no, uh, you'll notice if you read there, he decides to have the guards, have the guards who had guarded Peter, he took their lives. And then we're told at the end of that narrative, it's right around verse 12 or 13, but it's all right there in one uh, flowing narrative in Acts 12. You can read it. Uh, I, I was going to read it, but I'm running out of time, I think. Um, <clears throat> He went down to Caesarea. Okay, Caesarea, the capital city. And we're told that uh, he, at that point, uh, Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, says that he had also uh, extended some of his uh, ill will uh, to the people who were living in the towns of Tyre and Sidon. In other words, just up the coast a little bit. And so in other words, he was not only treacherous against the early church, Acts 12, the same chapter says he was involved in some shenanigans up there so that the people feared him. 
And he goes to Caesarea, and there's some sort of a festival day. Acts 12 says it was on an appointed day. Uh, Josephus says it was daybreak on the second day of the festival. We don't know what festival it was, but some official capacity. Uh, Acts 12 says that he walks into a public forum and his robe glistened. Uh, Josephus says he appeared in the theater, probably the same theater where you guys are going with me, because there's only one. <laughs> wearing a robe made of silver. And the people were impressed by the radiance of his robe dazzling in the sunlight. And just as we have in the book of Acts, we're told they cry out flatteries, they declare him to be a god, uh, and, they, and the people of Tyre and Sidon beg for his mercy. Yeah, yeah, you've been a bad guy up there, but we see the radiance of your robe here. You must be God, so we don't want to upset God. And he doesn't... Uh, seek to correct them, and this is also the story in the book of Acts, and as a result, God strikes him right there in the theater. They carry him out of the theater, to his, presumably to his house, to his palace, which would have been like 150 yards, and he dies in five days. So that's a, a fairly important story in Acts 12 about what happens to one of the Herods, the grandson of Herod the Great, when he seeks to persecute the early church and pretend that he is uh, some deity. And finally, number, well, finally for my purposes here, well, maybe not, next to finally, uh, the, the final Herod that is referred to is going to be the Herod, what we call Herod Agrippa II. Uh, and this is the man who also travels to Caesarea, the same place. Why does he travel to Caesarea? The book of Acts tells us. He and his wife travel to Caesarea to welcome the new prefect. His name is Festus, the same guy we have in the book of Acts. Well, there's a new, new uh, Roman procurator in town, and you say, how can there be a Herod when there's a procurator? The same reason you can have a Herod when there's a pilot. The, the procurators are in charge of Judea. The Herods have been pushed up into Galilee. Anyhow, he's king of Galilee, so he and his wife make a trip down to Caesarea. Hi, new guy in town, welcome him. And he tells them about a guy who's been sitting there in that Caesarea prison for about two years. Paul, by name, who has appealed to Rome. And this guy, being half Jewish, and knowing it was a Jewish accusation against Paul, just like it was a Jewish accusation against Jesus, wants to meet this guy. And this is where then Paul stands before Herod Agrippa and gives him the gospel. And you remember at the end of this, Agrippa says to Paul, almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Uh, I don't think that means he was under conviction, but he got out of it. It's probably uh, irony, and even if it's a truthful statement, it was probably satire on his part. Meaning, you're trying to convert me to Christianity? Don't you know who I am? In other words, I don't think Agrippa was quite there. He wasn't ready to step over the threshold of the kingdom. But the point is, this is the same guy. So you have a bunch of, of uh, Herods. And then, finally, number nine, wasn't born a Herod, but he decided to marry someone, a woman who was related, a lot of marriage here, and intermarriage, and uh, so forth. Uh, but anyhow, this is Felix. He is the, he was the uh, uh, Roman prefect. He was like uh, Pontius Pilate, except he was, he was later than, he, was, he wasn't in the time of Jesus. He was prefect in the time of Paul. So anyhow, you've got the Herods, but you have the story of Herod, um, and so forth and so on. Um, one more thing I'd like to say about uh, Herod uh, the Great and about uh, this realm, but I'd, I'd also like to maybe have some time to talk back and forth. Uh, I talked about all of the things that 
um, Herod built, the grandiose style in which he built. And he built all over the place, dozens of sites. The fingerprint, the architectural fingerprint of Herod, for those of you going on this trip, you will see Herod's architectural fingerprint almost every day. There's something that is still standing that was built, in point of fact, by Herod. And one of the things that he built was Roman roads. Now, he only built his roads inside Palestine, but Roman roads are still standing. They were built, they were built 2,000 years ago, and you can still walk on them. Uh, they had their own drainage, but did someone, someone says something, I forget. As a matter of, as a matter of fact, um, when the Roman, in Palestine, when the Romans stopped building paved roads, do you know when the next paved road was built? Thousand. Sorry? Thousand? Eight. Keep going. When cars were made? <laughs> yes, almost. Almost there. When chari uh, when it, uh, it was built by uh, the Germans in 1920 something or other, because the Kaiser, the Caesar, that's just the German, you know what I mean? Kaiser, Caesar, it's all the same, uh, just different languages, uh, had, had built a Lutheran church, the Church of the Redeemer, which is right close to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We'll see that church. And it was going to be dedicated by the Kaiser. And it was beneath his dignity not to ride in a chariot on a paved road and I think that was 1920 or 1925. That's the next paved road. And in fact, when the British took over Palestine, the so-called 30 years of the British mandate, they, by that point, you had asphalt. All they did was asphalt over top of the Roman roads because most of them were still intact. They had their own drainage system. They were wide enough and so forth and built uh, so you... You say, anyhow, that was Herod. Well, now I want to talk a little bit about what these greats contribute. By the way, they're all the greats. You have Darius the Great, Alexander the Great, Herod the Great, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent. Well, that's the, uh, if, if, if this were the big fat Greek wedding, I would say that's the Greek word for great. <laughs> Magna is the word. Mag Notice these guys are called so-and-so the great. They're almost never called so-and-so the pretty good. <laughs> so-and-so also ran. Caesar Augustus, he, not only did he become Caesar, but he wanted to become Caesar, the, the August Caesar. And my birthday is in August. I have tried for years to convince certain members of my family that I should be known as the August Barry. <laughs> Actually, Barry the Great sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> We're not, I can't get anyone in my family to quite agree with that, so you give it up. Uh, they weren't short on confidence. But on the other hand, when you think about it, Alexander uh, the, the realm that became the Greek Empire by the time Alexander was done is about 4,000 miles east-west. I suppose if I had led armies to gather up that kind of territory, I might think I was something too. In other words, from Chicago to Amsterdam. Think of it. The whole breadth of the Atlantic. That's all good. And that all was made. He, he, he created a uniform language. He imposed a Greek language. On, oh, so you have 4,000 miles of territory, all essentially speaking one and the same language. Then come the Romans and they build roads, these paved roads I was talking about. I have a map that dates to the 4th century AD, an actual Roman road map. We estimate something like 70,000 miles of paved Roman roads throughout all of that stretch. How many, how many miles are there in the U.S. Uh, interstate system? Anyone know? I mean, I'm sure it's more than that. But So, in other words, think, think of this in terms of the early days of the Gospel. Um, those early disciples 
who went out, who were thrust out in this direction and that direction, and they could go hundreds of miles north, east, west, a thousand miles or so, uh, north, south, a thousand miles or so, a couple thousand miles or so, east, west, and they could always have instant communication. I mean, in that, if you take a look at what was the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire, and then superimpose on that a modern map of the world, in the area that was unified around the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire, today, by my count, there are as many as 25 different languages being spoken. And churches, actually including village church, we send out missionaries into that world. And you hear of missionaries oftentimes having to spend years of language training. You know what I mean? And actually, in a few unfortunate cases, people come home and, and, and cash it in, so to speak, because they, they can't get over that hurdle. Imagine if they could get on a unified ro uh, road system and travel for thousands of miles and be able to speak the same. You talk about the providence of God at the moment that the gospel hits the scene of this world and the opportunities that those people would have. Part of that is related to Herod and to Herodian kind of people who saw themselves as being great and actually provided an entree, a stage, in which the drama of the gospel could be carried out in unprecedented sorts of ways. We praise the Lord because of it, it truly is a remarkable example of God's providence. That's not what Herod intended. That's not what Alexander intended. That's not what Darius intended. But it's what God intended. So if I could speak respectfully, uh, you might have Alexander the Great and Darius the Great and uh, Alexander the uh, Alexander the Great and Suleiman the Great and uh, the the August Caesar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the Lord the Great uh, who's behind the scene, directing all of those steps. Okay, I we've got seven minutes, and and I I apologize. I saw your hand a little bit ago, and I was saying to myself, I need to finish that point. And I proceeded to finish that point and also forgot about you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. It, I don't have a question. You answered it. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah? I have a question in regards to uh, the dialect of a Galilean. The, di yeah, the dialect of a Galilean. Yeah. yeah. How is that depicted, you know, versus... We how, oh, we don't know what it would have looked like. But we do know that there were dialects. And one of the ways, even in the Old Testament, the reason that we know that there were regional dialects, even inside the Old Testament, is the way that the names of certain... The, in, in the period of what we call the divided kingdom, you know what I mean? After David and Solomon and before Jerusalem was destroyed, we call that period the divided kingdom. And up north, the so-called ten northern tribes in Samaria, there were a total of 19 kings. Simultaneously, down in Jerusalem, there was a, a king down there, a, a David king, all that time. And there were 19 kings. On both sides of the ledger, there are 19 kings. Well, some of those guys have the same name. But it's not spelled the same way. There's, there's, a dialogue, there's a, one dialect up in Samaria. We might call it the Samarian dialect. And there's a Judean dialect. That it's just very much the same um, if a person goes to Boston, you know, a Bostonian dialect and a uh, Florida, or well, maybe a Georgian Alabama. dialect, <laughs> Alabama dialect. That's, that's probably not the, the same. And I think that, so yeah, they, it, it, I mean, we can, we can guess, we can speculate what it might have looked like, but that's one of the reasons, isn't it, why, why Peter was identified that way. Because your speech betrays you. We have no idea. But did he, did, he, uh, <clears throat> did he use a certain verb? Did he use a certain pronoun? It's not, or was he speaking with, uh, it's like, you know, uh, if I were reading, I read Matthew 2, you know, here I am in northern Illinois. Uh, 
uh, the wise men came from afar. But down south, they say the wise men must have been firemen because the wise men came from afar. <laughs> A friend of mine who now lives in Wisconsin, well, Kaiser, that's his line, yeah. 46,000 miles of interstate in the U.S. <laughs> Are you serious? 46, As of what date is that? Is that a contemporary? Are you telling me that the Romans had more paved roads than we do in the United States? Oh, is that? Oh, I'm sorry, interstate. Yes, yes. I mean the inter the Eisenhower system. Yes. Really? Is that right? I thought someone would say, oh, a couple hundred thousand. We we know of seventy thousand, well, approximately seventy, because they're actually marked and they uh, and they're identified, and we can go and find them. <laughs> wow, I, I thank you for that. That's I must say I'm surprised at that. I I, I want to say that whoever put that in put it in about 1970. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Barry. Just a, kind of a personal reflection question. Um, you've been so many places. You're so excited and passionate about talking about this. Is there? Uh, a place that you would like to rank up there personally, and, and can you tell us about that and why you rank it that way? Okay, yeah, I will if that's, if that's useful. Uh, there's uh, uh, people, you know, when you, when you take as many different groups and you've been there as many different times, and maybe as I and others who've been there as much as I, I I'm asked, I don't know, once a month, don't you get tired of that? And, and yeah, there are certain aspects of it I do get tired of. I really do. Some of the details and so forth. But there's one place on the itinerary that is more than uh, puts the weights back in the right direction. Uh, I'll take you to that place. Uh, uh, it's not even technically a biblical place, but you're looking over a lot that is biblical. And what you can see from the top of that hill, if you're willing to walk with me a little, uh, and hear the story of, if, those, if the stones on the top of that hill could speak, oh boy, would they have a story to tell. Uh, but to see, yeah, to see, to see God at work in history is probably the thing that keeps me going to the degree that I'm still going. Uh, um, and, and I mean, um, you know, there are places, there are, there are archaeological tells where the people who do work on those tells tell us about as many as 20, 25, 30 different occupational layers. Kingdoms come and go, but the kingdom of the Lord remains forever. Would you allow me to wait for a few weeks and talk more to you, Brian? Yeah. Oh, it's called the Arbel Cliffs. Oh, okay. You know where that is? Yes, I went there. And that's where, I mean, there's a lot of Jewish history. Yeah. You'll see cliffs that are vertical, hundreds of feet. And again, Josephus tells us that there were people who were not about to become Romans, and they were not about to succumb to Roman. These are, these are Orthodox Jews. And they are, and they're all, all along that hillside, it's just honeycombed with caves, niches, 14, 15 feet deep. Not caves like where you, not coal caves in Pennsylvania, but just niches. Mm -hmm. And the Romans just, they went over the top with ropes down to that level and hooks, grabbed those people, just brought them out and just threw them like that by the hundreds. And they, they just fell hundreds of feet. And Josephus talks about one, one man who was so, um, who, who could not, he simply refused to countenance himself as a Roman slave and takes his children one by one to the mouth of that cave. Even though Vespasian, the, the father of uh, Titus, the guy who takes out, Vespasian is down at the bottom trying to reckon with this guy. And he takes child number one, throws him off, throws him off, throws him off, and finally he throws off his wife, and then he stands there himself and finally speaks to the general who later became the emperor, Vespasian. 
and in effect said to him, you know, you may have my house, you may have my land, but you ain't going to get me. I am not going to live as a Roman and, and commit suicide. Stories, uh, but the, the reason I'm going there is not for the Jewish stories. I'm going there for the Christian stories and for what can what you can see and what you can imagine from a certain location. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, our time is gone. So, oh, yeah, sure. The, uh, the list of those traveling didn't make Oh, thank you. Yeah. It, it didn't get around. Okay, where is the list, if I may ask? Is it over?